uh, Islamism and Islamophobia under global capitalism. I would like to say that um, at the current uh, sociopolitical juncture we live in, one that is characterized by militarization, securitized authoritarianism, economic precarity, and moral panic, whether it be in the global south or the global north, I find the work of uh, Efren uh, very urgent to help us formulate new understandings of state violence through a queer lens that takes seriously the need to do translations. Queer in Translation offers a materialist perspective that helps envision a queer politics that has the potential to get us past the restrictive question of whether uh, and how much to be with or against political Islam. It also highlights how uh, sexual politics, class formation, and global capitalism influence one another. According to Efren, Islam cannot be understood as occupying a pure place of indigeneity that is outside the domain of political economy. Based on the Turkish context, Efren argues that the Turkish Islamic political history and morality is one that has been produced in conjunction with neoliberalism. By thinking of neoliberalism and Islam together through queer studies, we can hope to articulate an approach that takes seriously the task of simultaneously avoiding occidentalisms while also debunking orientalisms. Focusing on political economy is useful because it helps us get a fresh take on the topic and shift the terms of the debate. This approach also prompts us to imagine uh, different possibilities that emerge from the paradoxes of political Islam and its diverse live realities, and possibilities that allow us to understand how our struggles are interconnected under global capitalism. So for those of you who don't know Efren, uh, Efren Savge is an assistant professor uh, of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Yale University. Her first book, Queer in Translation, uh, published by Duke University Press last year, analyzes uh, sexual politics under contemporary Turkey's AKP regime with an eye on the travel and translation of sexual political vocabulary. Her second book, Project, turns to the political economy of monogamy. In it, she addresses the establishment of it as a central tenet of civilized sexual morality and attends to the current neoliberal incorporation of its alternatives and restoration of its uh, distributive logic. Savage's work uh, uh, on the intersections of language, knowledge, sexual politics, neoliberalism, and religion has appeared in Journal of Marriage and the Family, Ethnography, Sexualities, Political Power and Social Theory, Theory and Event, Journal of Feminist Studies in Religion and GLQ, and in several edited collections. Savji re received her PhD in Sociology from University of Th Southern California and her Master's and Bachelor's degree in Sociology from University of Virginia. Following her PhD, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Sexualities Project at Northwestern. Now I would like to say a few words about uh, Leila. Uh, Leila completed her master's studies at the University of Heidelberg with a dual major in anthropology and political science and a minor in transcultural studies. She is currently pursuing her doctoral uh, studies at the University of Humboldt in Berlin at the Department of South Asian uh, Studies and her research focuses on the linkages between West Asia and South Asia, inter interrogating notions of identity, belonging, citizenship, class, caste, religion, gender, borders, and transcultural uh, sociality. Uh, this is an extension of her previous work on topics like uh, uh, Brexit, the South Asian vote and identity politics, and publications about the myriad contestations surrounding the embodiment of oppositional categories under queer identity politics. Uh, and before giving uh, the floor to Efren, I have a few pra practical remarks. So the talk will be around uh, half an hour, followed by a short response uh, by Leila, uh, to which Efren will uh, briefly respond. Then we have around 25 minutes for Q&A. Uh, so get your questions ready. Uh, also for people online, uh, you can post it uh, uh, in the chat. Uh, and uh, I, I will note it, and, and later at the end of the session, I will, I will, I will read it. So welcome, uh, Efren and Leila, uh, and thanks for being here. And uh, yeah, now I give the floor to uh, Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for waiting so patiently before, before everything. Um, and hopefully, 
some people are able to join us um, online, but I'm very glad that we're here in person. Uh, it's really nice to be here um, at to, uh, to talk about my book, book with you. Um, and um, I want to start by thanking um, the Netherlands Research School of Gender Studies um, and the Trace University for having me here, in particular to Nisreen for the invitation, for this lovely introduction, and for chairing our session, um, and to Leila for being my respondent and for the conversation, and to um, Sudan for, for working so hard at organizing today's event and belaboring for half an hour to make this go live, which hopefully we have managed. Um, this is the, um, it's been over a year since the book came out. This is the first time I'm doing an in-person event, so I cannot tell you how exciting this is. I'm so happy we can do this in person. Because I will be speaking um, for half an hour, I thought the best use of the time would be to introduce the larger project and the conceptual work um, I try to do in it and the contributions I aim to make and give a quick example. Um, I talk about, there are four chapters in the book, um, each one of which talks about a different case. So this talk will not really do justice to each of those stories, but I'm happy to, and maybe through Leila's engagement and the conversations, I will be covering a little bit more. But I'm happy to talk about anything really during the Q&A. Queer in translation takes as its departure point the political shifts Turkey has experienced during the time of my fieldwork and its aftermath. Back in 2008, when I started research, the AKP government under the leadership of then Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan was rapidly working on democratizing the country within the context of the European Union membership accession process. They changed misogynistic language in laws, including the removal of references to concepts such as morality, chastity, honor, or virginity from the penal code. They criminalized marital rape and recategorized sexual assault under crimes against the individual instead of crimes against public morality. They abolished the death penalty, started talks about education in mother tongue for all, including Kurdish, and they launched the first Kurdish language public TV station. They also started talks about mutually opening borders and reviving diplomatic relationships with Armenia. There were also conversations about a headscarf opening that would allow the wearing of the Islamic headscarf in public universities and offices, which was banned at the time. It was in this climate and under the AKP regime that the annual LGBTI plus Pride March that had started in 2001 grew significantly in size, and so did the number of queer and trans organizations around the country. While the simultaneity of these developments, the rise of a moderate Islamist party to power, and the growth and proliferation of LGBT movements might be understood as contradictory forms of social change in most Western liberal democracies, they were initially welcomed by many among Turkish left-leaning liberals as signs of the increasing cultural liberalization of a nation. A nation with a patriarchal and heteronormative, but also a militarist and strictly secular history. A history that had rendered strong LGBT movements and strong parliamentary representation of the Muslim voter base, perhaps equally unimaginable. We fast forward to 2015, and the Pride March was attacked by the police with tear gas, plastic bullets, and water cannons. The Kurdish peace process was in shambles, and heavily Kurdish-populated towns in Diyarbakir, Ahmed, were put under siege by the military. And Erdogan was lecturing at this disrespectful, in quotes, women and feminists to behave from various platforms claiming that abortion is murder and telling all families to have at least three children. Later, under the state of emergency following the coup attempt of 2016, any and all LGBT events, such as film screenings, lectures, or performances were banned in the capital Ankara under the auspices of security measures. This shift for, that was a temporary ban, just to uh, mention this, but it lasted for a while. This shift from democratization to authoritarian crushing of all dissent is my object of study, which I attribute to the rise of neoliberal Islam. So queer in translation became the study of sexual and queer politics that unfolded under the marriage between neoliberalism and Islam as devised by the AKP regime. Following Indar Paul Grewal, I suggest that if neoliberal capitalism produces um, is a system that produces increasing precarity for larger groups of people, 
through the disappearance of the middle class, the rise of surplus existence, the disappearing of welfare and related social safety nets, um, rising dispossession and rising debt, and crushing of labor unions. And if it justifies such inequality via moralizing mechanisms, production of the categories of deserving versus undeserving poor, the rise of respectability politics, increasing individualization of responsibility, and emphasis on self-sufficiency and self-entrepreneurialism. So if we, on the one hand, have um, an increasing um, precarity for larger groups of people, which then gets um, justified through moralizing mechanisms, then in the case of Turkey, I argue, Islamic morality factors as the key mechanism through which neoliberalism is domesticated and through which the government designates between the deserving and the undeserving between the good moral citizens and the bad immoral elements conspiring with foreign powers for the government's downfall, and between those who need to be securitized and those who will aid with securitization. Queer politics in particular emerges as a site where the effects of the existing regime of morality, as well as resistances to it, become crystallized. Let me quickly clarify a couple of things about my use of the term Islam. Um, my use of the word throughout the book, so my use of Islam throughout the book, is not intended to homogenize its meaning or suggest that there is an essence to it. I rather argue for contextualizing Islam as a lived reality grounded in political economy and government rule, as opposed to its current treatment in queer studies as a symbol or a dis discursive device. I'm going to say a little bit more on this in a minute. While my, my main goal has been to illustrate the complexities of sexual politics under neoliberal Islam, the stories I recount in the book also, and perhaps inevitably, demonstrate the multiplicity of Islam among those who live it and speak on its behalf, despite the Turkish government's increasing efforts to homogenize and monopolize its meaning. And secondly, Islam, I argue, needs to be historicized in any one of its uses. In that, and in that spirit, I explain that the marriage of neoliberalism and Islam in Turkey predates the AKP regime. In fact, the introduction of neoliberalism and the particular public so-called moderate Islam to Turkey both date to the military coup of September 12, 1980. The post-coup military junta was central in transforming the Turkish economy from a state-led <coughs> closed market system with an emphasis on national production and consumption and strict regulations on import into an open market system following the IMF and World Bank supported structural adjustment policies. The same junta government also preempted any organized resistance to this process through banning many forms of political organizing, including labor unions, and jailing their leaders. Turkey, as a result, became one of the key testing sites um, of the joint IMF World Bank approach. If economic neoliberalization was one significant outcome of the 1980 coup, its other key effect was the introduction of Islam, and more specifically, what was referred to as Turk Islam Santizi, which translates as Turkish Islamic Synthesis as a social glue, a remedy to political rifts in the country. This so-called remedy was intended to end the political divisions um, between communists and the fascist ultra-right. ...with a more cohesive religious culture. This move was also done in conjunction with US's war against the communist threat and ultimately led to the crushing of the left and the strengthening of, center, strengthening of the center right in Turkey. This period in fact saw the encouragement of liberal Islam all over the Middle East because of fears regarding the radicalization of Islam in Iran. Thus, it is impossible to understand Islam in contemporary Turkey apart from these histories of de-leftification and de-radicalization. Yet the key intellectual contribution of queer and translation is not one of establishing the truth or detailing the mechanisms of neoliberal Islam. I'm rather interested in the productive paradox neoliberal Islam posits to queer studies as the field has taken significantly different critical and epistemological positions vis-a-vis -vis the two terms of this political, economic, religious order whereby neoliberalism is an object of queer critique and Islam an object of queer rescue. 
What I might mean by this very briefly, and I'm happy to talk more during the Q&A, is that on the one hand, queer studies has been deeply critical of neoliberalism and its taming effects on sexual dissent. On the other, Islam in queer studies is often analyzed as the target of Western imperialism, and discussions about Islam are located in context of Muslim minority populations, Muslim immigrants, and Islamoph Islamophobia deployed in former nationalist justifications of the US war on terror or the continued Israeli occupation of Palestine. This tendency results in most discussions of neoliberalism being confined to US and Western Europe context and in situating Islam whenever it is addressed as the subjugated other of Western modernity, which results in a simultaneous culturalization and racialization of Islam. I suggest that these diametrically opposed treatments of neoliberalism and Islam in queer studies are symptomatic of a key epistemic, epistemic problem in the field, that of reading non-normatively gendered and sexualized subjects elsewhere, so outside of the global north, through the paradigm of anthropological difference. This results in positioning queers in the so-called non-West either as authentic local subjects or modernized, globalized, and therefore inauthentic. Sexual liberation movements that organize in the so-called third world under any variation of the moniker LGBT have been rendered particularly suspect in queer studies as the sexual identities they embrace and the liberation politics they practice are often imagined to shore up Western imperial claims about non-Western cultures as backward, non-democratic, and homophobic. This is especially true of the Muslim world since recent imperial wars waged against the Middle East have been justified among conservative and liberal queer organizations alike with arguments about state homophobia and violence in these societies. So they become also wars of or for queers in their eyes. The significance of queer critique aimed at the deployment of liberal LGBT rights to justify imperial wars and Islamophobia notwithstanding, the authentic colonial binary that underlies the scholarship has made it difficult to theorize the complexities of both what circulates under the signifier Islam and of sexual political movements in Muslim majority countries. In other words, since homonationalism is presented as the security arm of homonormativity, whereby homonormative queer life seeks to be protected by a number of means, including the desire to be protected from <coughs> alleged Muslim homophobia, Islam and Muslims can only occupy the position of the victims of neoliberalism, but not really its perpetrators. The methodological solution I offer to this epistemological problem is that of translation. I trace the travel and translation of modern political languages around gendered and sexual minorities, such as gender identity, sexual orientation, hate crimes, homophobia, and LGBT rights, within the context of contemporary Turkey and analyze how they enter public political discussions in order to understand the contours and the effects of neoliberal Islam, as well as its internal contradictions and unexpected outcomes that make room for resistance and for social change. Critical translation studies is helpful in moving away from the colonial authentic binary because the field deeply historicizes and denaturalize, denaturalizes the link between language and culture and opens up a way to rethink what seems to be the perpetual unspoken equation of language equals culture equals difference equals decolonial. So let me say a few words on translation studies and rethinking language in queer studies. Despite queer studies' commitment to critiquing identity and universalism, and despite the field's recognition of the constitutive powers of language, it is only very recently that queer studies scholars have recognized the English-centeredness of much of queer studies itself. While I discuss the repercussions of this in, my, in the book, my central focus is on queer studies' participation in the ideology of homolingual address and not the specificity of English. Translation studies scholar Naoki Sakai maintains that the homolingual address imagines the world made up of communities of languages. So it's like a United Nations model of languages, um, if you will, where languages are supposed to be easily identifiable as autonomous and distinct from each other. As opposed to this unspoken homolingual address that dominates most fields of inquiry and forms what translation studies scholars call the modern regime of translation, 
Critical translation studies scholars remind us that language as an object with particular attributes and constituting comparable entities is a historical construct itself. Linguistic practices without proper names were deemed deviations as a result of romanticism and disqualified as proper language. Moreover, the nationalization of languages and the formation of what was considered a mother tongue um, occurred as a result of the formation of nation states. This establishment of monolingualism further naturalized and reified the nation and its citizens' relationship to it. A distinct national language worked to establish the nation as authentic, accompanied by the erasure and at times ban of indigenous languages or their reduction to dialect. Therefore, it is useful to keep in mind that what we recognize as languages today are themselves products of a political history of national modernity. As a result, arguments that equate, and these, this might sound familiar to you, and if not, I'm happy to say more during the Q&A, arguments that equate the appearance of new names for sexual subjectivity, say words like gay or lesbian, in a particular language, say the Turkish language, as a colonial effect, inevitably naturalize the said national languages as indigenous, thereby erasing the heterolingual and polyglot histories of these spaces, as well as ongoing struggles to maintain them which in the case of Turkey includes speakers of Kurdish, Armenian, Circassian, Sasaki, Laz, Greek, Arabic, serbo croatian and Ladino. Employing translation as a methodology in my work when I analyze the travel of sexual and queer politics terminology to Turkey helps me think about the question of difference without reproducing the universalism particularism binary. I suggest that we do not use the term translation to indicate a seamless move from one language to another in order to bridge linguistic gap and find common ground, but instead to indicate social disjunctures. Those social disjunctures became my objects of study. For instance, in one of the chapters of the book, in the first chapter, I trace the travel of the terms LGBT rights and homophobia to the context of the headscarf debates in Turkey. So each chapter traces different terms. I don't trace um, sexual identity terms like gay, lesbian, bisexual, um, or trans, and I'm more, much happy to say a lot more about that during the Q&A. Just for time's sake now, I'll just go with this example. Um, I show that the equivalence established between LGBT rights and the headscarf right through a human rights framework in the context of Islamist AKP's neo neoliberal multiculturalism and democratic openings and against the historical background of staunch secularism, ultimately led to the treatment of LGBT rights as a litmus test for headscarf, headscarf activists, a test promoted by suspicious secularists to see whether the commitment to heads, of headscarf activists to democratic rights and liberties was sincere, and thus to establish whether they deserved their own democratic rights. Um, a reduction of these events to the question, so they, um, there were many uh, moments, especially in media discussions, where um, headscarf activists were asked whether they also supported LGBT rights, almost as a test to see if they would pass this um, test of democracy. A reduction of these events to the question of what Islam thinks about homosexuality is deeply misguided, however. This is both because the transnational econo economic and political developments at the time, especially the EU accession process, deeply shaped these discourses, and because various Islamic actors and headscarf activists displayed differing views on the issue of homosexual rights, including debates about whether homosexuality shall be understood as an illness or as a sin. At the same time, and those two are seen as contradictory frameworks. At the same time, framing the debate as a product of discursive colonialism and its associated epistemic violence is equally misguided. This is because it was not only LGBT activists, but also headscarf activists who use a rights framework to discuss particular incidences of state and social violence taking place at the time. I will share a few quick points from this chapter that I hope will help illustrate the limits of understanding these debates through and within the binaries of authentic colonial, local, global, religious, secular, or what the West versus the East. I think we're having a little bit of um, that's okay. feedback. Okay. If it's okay, that's the only solution I found now. We have a sound, so. Okay. Um, so for one, even when Muslim activists called out other headscarf activists for not being true to Islam, they were not cultural purists 
For instance, colonist Hilal Kaplan invited Muslims to a more authentic Islamic position by asking why Muslims would accept a secular scientific framework of homosexuality as illness without questioning the power knowledge structure that made possible both the initial declar declaration of homosexuality as an illness and the subsequent removal of it from the category of illness or abnormality in the West. So this is her call to think about homosexuality as a sin, as a more authentic Islamic position. Her position was shot through with Foucaultian critiques of the history of sexuality and the rise of scientific institutions in the West. In fact, her column at the time often housed references to Western post-structuralist psychoanalytic theorists and theorists of power and sovereignty, such as Foucault, Zizek, Schmidt, Lukács, and Adorno and Horkheimer, among others. Undermining simplistic frames of cultural authenticity, such moments exemplify that it is not only Western liberal epistemic frameworks, such as human rights, that travel elsewhere, but also their post-structuralist and post-colonial critiques that can emanate from the so-called West. Secondly, when rights as a framework travel to Turkey and are discussed publicly, the word that is used is hak. Hak is a capacious term derived from Arabic and used to mean right as in human rights in Turkish in some hakları, but also justice in general, as in the phrase hak yerine buldu, so justice found its place, justice was delivered. Hak is also one of the 99 names of Allah, exemplifying and emphasizing the significance of justice in Islam. This is not to say that there is no way to use the term rights in a secular way, but rather that secular and religious meanings are inevitably imbricated, which some headscarf activists use to separate a capacious understanding of justice for all from what they understood to be identity politics, which they were being forced into. And the final point um, I'm gonna make is from a meeting, and the only one to my knowledge that actually took place between LGBT activists and, hand, and a handful of headscarf activists um, in person, otherwise most of, most of these debates um, happened um, and unfolded in the media, where secular concerns about the headscarf opening were being voiced through LGBT rights being evoked as a witness test. The meeting took place in the midst of dialogue and solidarity efforts among various feminist, LGBT, and Muslim groups. The Turkish-Armenian journalist Hrant Dink had recently been assassinated, causing a huge social outcry and resulting in the formation of a number of groups, including the January 19th platform, through which citizens from differing political positions gathered to think about ways of organizing collectively against state-condoned racist violence. At the meeting, the headscarf activists presented what LGBT activists referred to as an Islamic utopia in which the violent interventionist state led by arrogant politicians would be replaced by a system in which every subject would be guided by Islamic ethics and duties and also their own conscience. The secular state would always be more authoritarian as well as more repressive and controlling than this new Islamic order because in a secular regime, people do not feel humbled in the presence of Allah, they claimed. Further, the headscarf activists maintained, even when Islam deemed particular acts haram, it had utmost respect for mahram, which I will translate as the private sphere for, this, for the moment. Therefore, even as homosexuality was considered sinful according to Islam, no one should interfere with an individual's private affairs. By demanding legislative changes, they said LGBT activists were inviting the state into their bedrooms, which was exactly what the secular state wanted anyway. The headscarf activists thought that queer theory supported their critique of identity politics, as well as their rejection of a desire to be recognized by the state, citing Judith Butler several times during the meeting. When LGBT activists asked what they thought about the recent declaration by some ulama in Indonesia regarding Islam not having a clear position on homosexuality, the headscarf activists indicated that they did not take that declaration too seriously. The meeting notes state that the FEC scholars, so Islamic jurisprudence scholars, these Muslim activists follow and trust must be more orthodox than the Indonesian ulama. The queer activists argued that it was impossible to separate the public and the private and to overlook the ways in which the public is already sexualized through the institutions of heterosexual marriage and the family. Under conditions of compulsory heterosexuality, coming out was the only way not to be presumed heterosexual. They pressed further. 
How could one take a stance against cruelty without also standing against the very structures that produce the conditions of cruelty? Muslim activists did not respond to this directly, but later in the meeting conceded that in Islam, the public sphere is heterosexual. While the disagreements in the meeting were real, so was the mutual desire to communicate and seek ways to support each other. Yet positioning the disagreement in terms of incommensurability between homosexuality and Islam reifies both terms. While discussions in the meeting highlighted various positions on homosexuality in Islam on behalf of queer and Muslim activists, the debate on the liberating versus limiting nature of mahram also deserve a similar complexity since mahram, understood as private, um, and thus in contradistinction to public, is itself a modern reinterpretation. Sabah Mahmoud argues that the simultaneous relegation of gender and sexuality and of religion to the private realm by the secular state, and I quote from her, has tied up their regulative fates in such a way that struggles over religion often unfold over the terrain of gender and sexuality. So um, once all religion, gender, and sexuality have become releg relegated to the private sphere under liberal systems, they get entangled in really uh, contentious ways. In other words, Mahmoud maintains that, in quote, while religious morality has always been concerned with sexuality, their delineation as quintessential elements of private life under secular modernity has created an explosive symbiosis between them that is historically unique." End of quote. Departing from her, I suggest that it is not only religion that is privatized through secular modernity, but our very understandings of public and private are shaped by it. In other words, while the notion of mahram could be argued to be authentically Islamic, the ways in which it is imagined to overlap with the modern concept of private exemplified by the Muslim activist references to the bedroom are not. Therefore, as Muslim activists argue for an Islamic utopia, they too make such arguments as subjects produced by histories of modernization and secularization. I argue that these debates showcase the limits of both a purely secular and a purely Islamic response to the issue of state violence and demand a historicized approach to both categories. I suggest that this task proves to be exceedingly important given increasing violence in Turkey perpetrated by a government that justifies its actions in the name of Islamic morality and consolidates its voter base with a discourse of standing up for believers. In the chapter, I also gesture towards a potential politics of cruelty that would necessitate that various, various groups build coalitions around standing up against cruelty instead of standing up for abstract rights especially given that the same violent securitization measures that were once applied to women with headscarves are now being applied to LGBT activists, as well as anyone who will not submit to the government's authoritarian rule. I do not offer the concept of a politics of cruelties as a perfect solution to violence, and neither do I claim for it to be a framework of radical alterity vis-a-vis -vis Western modernity. Instead, I suggest that it be understood as a space of negotiation for solidarities that are necessary for people to live, to collectively live self-determined and dignified lives. As the number of groups targeted with various forms of state violence is on the rise in Turkey, all citizens need to hear different accounts of systemic state and social violence that are injuring many already vulnerable populations. Understanding our social existence as multiple and being able to have conversations about such vital matters as enduring state violence and violence is produced by manifold normativities are at the heart of political existence. Our ability to strategize against oppression and find ways to flourish and thrive depends, at least partially, on our willingness to listen to each other differently. Using translation as a methodology helps me follow these messy travels of meaning and see that it is precisely in those moments that trouble both the meanings of vocabularies of gender and sexuality, as well as the political regimes that employ them, that we can discover productive spaces for thinking and being otherwise. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Abram. Shall uh, I stay here yes. or shall we switch? What do you think? Um, yeah, if you want to maybe go here so that you, you more on the camera. Whatever is easy. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. 
apologies again for the late start. Um, thank you, Nisreen, for inviting me to be a part of this lecture, and thanks to the um, Energy PhD Council for organizing it. Um, everyone, thank you for this wonderful and important book. I resonated with many parts of it, and I also found interesting parallels with what is happening in different parts of the Global South, or the Northwest, or the Third World, or however we want to call it. Um, one thing that particularly stood out for me was how this framework of critical translation studies explodes the categories of local and indigenous on an east-west binary, and instead it allows us to think of languages as national constructs and categories. This is uh, most useful when considering the way language polit politics is playing out currently in India, where there is a weaponization of one language in particular, which is deemed to be the national language, um, which everyone must supposedly speak now to be considered a faithful citizen. This is in a country where there are 22 languages listed as official in the constitution and is actually home to hundreds of languages and thousands of dialects. On a related note, there are also calls for education in English at state schools, so government-run schools, by people from working class and oppressed caste communities because this can aid in social and economic mobility because in India, speaking English is a marker that accords one with many material benefits. This is often contested politically and publicly with rhetoric around English being the language of the colonizer, drawing again on the so-called indigenous East, colonizer West split, which in this case is in direct opposition to a material praxis. Um, I wanted to touch on uh, two parts of the book with questions for possible exploration or maybe just food for thought. Um, I found the detailing of events at the night club uh, or the queer club Kadinja uh, very interesting when viewed via the lens of class politics and prejudice. And this also leaves open um, different ways for us to think about how class plays a formative role in structuring social categories. Um, here in this uh, chapter, you discuss how activists from um, Lambda Istanbul critique the atmosphere of the club uh, with reference to fights that took place and how they were put off by the so-called sexually aggressive female masculinities of the clientele. And you later explain how um, this wasn't about reproducing masculine norms, but about a particular working class kind of masculinity that was being configured as distasteful and the fights um, that allegedly took place there or that took place um, weren't very serious, no one got hurt, and they were often of a performative nature. So this coding of the club as, you say, um, as an unacceptable, uncivilized, a mas place of uncivilized, unacceptable masculinities shows us how gender is always raised and classed. Uh, further in this chapter, you discuss how even within the sphere of Lambda Istanbul, a trans man was called out by a lesbian activist from the same collective um, also for reproducing um, cultural practices of manhood and how he had the language and the knowledge with regard to the gender binary being socially reproduced to offer a counter critique and state how the cultural practices of femininity was also an equally being reproduced in a similar manner which was then accepted by the activists. So this um, chapter leads me to consider how this links up with second wave feminist ideas even if this was predicated in the first instance um, and redressed in the second on class distinctions, the underlying critique is one where um, masculinity and violence are metonym, and this can often lapse into various kinds of essentialism, where femininity is coded as good and oppressed, and masculinity in need of control and containment because it is oppressive or always oppressive. And these essentialized framings, as we know, can deeply impact trans, queer, and intersex people in many ways. But it also negatively impacts cis men who are minoritized and marginalized, and not always across a gender sexual axis. What also made me speculate on this was, I recently read an article by Lara Oslan, titled, No Turfs on Our Turf, Building Alliances Through Fractions on Social Media in Istanbul. Um, which discusses public articulations of trans subjectivities and highlights the points of contestation between, in the author's words, myriad gender and sexuality related activisms, notably the cis feminist, trans feminist binary. And the author, in fact, traces these tensions back to the 1980s in Istanbul, 
although we may think of these uh, tensions as being more re more recent, um, at least in parts of the Northwest. An interesting point in Oslan's article is the way in which the women who were cis uh, feminists, uh, and that's how they identified as feminists, feminist activists, um, the way in which when they were accused of transphobia and being TERFs, retorted with a counter discourse of how trans exclusionary feminists are a Western phenomena, and the term TERF itself, being a Western import, has no application to people who live in Turkey. Um, which again brings us back to the point of these categories of indigenous uh, slash Western and how uh, they are being used in different ways, uh, weaponized in different ways on a number of different fronts. But this binary is also being used in um, several settings to argue for the rights of minoritized and marginalized groups, including queer and trans people. This frame does, and I would add unfortunately because it also produces a lot of violence, but nevertheless, it does have a huge parlance in the organizing and mobilization, uh, mobilizing of socially oppressed groups. So I was wondering how we can understand or take positions um, to this kind of a framing when it is used for progressive politics or it's used by precarious people to deflect from harm and violence. Like, can we make these distinctions? And if so, how can we make them? And what might they look like? Um, which brings me to my last point, um, which is regarding the bifurcation of Islam and neoliberalism in queer studies and the American bias um, that a lot of academic fields, even outside of queer and gender studies, struggle under. While I do agree with this problem and the fact that the East as indigenous and the West as colonizer binary can obscure power relations that operate in other parts of the world, I often see another bifurcation taking place from a reverse position, which once again obscures other precarities as binaries are wont to do. In the introduction, um, in the introduction chapter, you talk about um, the discourse regarding queer securitization, where Muslim and Islam makes a steady appearance, and then you further discuss the impact of Jasbir Poar's concept of homo nationalism where you write, um, and I'm quoting from the book, there is no doubt about the significance of this work given the rising fascism and anti-Muslim xenophobia in the United States and Europe that repeats such old tropes as a clash of civilizations and the radical un incomparability of an ominous Islam. However, while extremely helpful, generative and politically urgent, this focus on Islamophobia, homo-nationalism and pinkwashing as experienced and performed in Euro-American contexts, inevitably frames Islam based on its discursive and symbolic production through an Orientalist Islamophobic world order. How can we think about the effects of political Islam in Muslim majority contexts in general, and in the case of Turkey, under neoliberal Islam in particular, where the dynamics of which lives are folded into national belonging and which lives are cast out as moral or national others are complicated by the coming together of these two systems." End quote. Um, so the tension for me that I see here is this tendency to think of Muslim minorities as living exclusively in the West, as being Euro-American. And this is also um, something that plays out quite frequently in queer activist spaces that are MENA dominant or have a lot of people from Muslim majority contexts, which in turn invisibilizes the social histories and the geopolitical constellations of many other countries in the global south, where Muslims are again in fact minorities and localized forms of anti-Muslim prejudice combined with global forms of Islamophobia producing extreme precarity. The power relations of South Asia and East Asia with the so-called Muslim world or countries which are Muslim majorities are disappeared in this constellation. So I would just like to caution that one kind of decentering should not produce another. A binary is always obscure more than they reveal. Although this certainly isn't what the book is doing, it often happens in a lot of queer activist and mobilizing spaces in the West where there are uh, large groups of people from very different social contexts and different parts of the global South who are coming together and trying to do um, politics at various levels. Um, so while there are different power constellations, of course, that operate in different regions, um, we shouldn't pretend that these are totally separate spheres 
and that they have no relationality with each other. And a focus on materiality in political economy means we have to be cognizant of the fact that discourses are constantly circulating between all regions. People are constantly circulating between all regions. Goods and capital are circulating between all regions, and they're all wedded together with geopolitics. For example, South Asia makes up a very large part of the working classes in many Muslim-majority countries. Um, I'd like to stop there. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Leila, for these comments. Um, I'm going to go in the order in which you have posed the questions, but I will start answering the first one, and I think I'm going to consult with you to make sure I am, and I'm understanding or, or I'm not missing any parts of it. So. Um, Anna is going to be very happy to hear that she was quoted at this event. Um, so I'll say something about masculinity and violence um, being seen as metonyms. I mean, I think that it is um, unrefined masculinity, right? That there is this understanding that masculinity um, in its most barbaric forms, right, um, is um, Synony you know, synonymous uh, with violence, but um, as it becomes civilized, it will behave. But there is something essential, right? Um, there's something to its essence. And um, you're right to point out that this not only does this have repercussions for, um, so this is a very different chapter from the one I have talked about. So you're now getting sampling different bits of different chapters. Um, there, um, this has implications for, um, as you said, not only trans men, but also cis men, because the um, case that I'm trying to make in that chapter is the um, transness or non-binaryness or gender queerness um, of those masculine bodies were irrelevant. What was much more relevant and pronounced was their um, more kind of working class behavior that was coded by um, so this is a chapter in which I uh, compare, I'd say two forms of critique, but I call one of it critique and the other one comments as um, kind of left strategies. One to me is a bit of a failed left strategy and the other one a bit more promising one. Um, and in the critique, I talk about the relationship between queer activists to um, the kind of queer, mostly like AFAB queer goers of this club that was um, back then now it, the clientele has completely changed, but back then it was quite working class. So it was people who worked um, as you know at retail or at barber shops and things like that, and they had kind of like one night um, a week off in which they came to this club. And they and the sort of class markers were things like like the fights were a big deal for the activists, and that was an unacceptable um, thing for them, and that was kind of reproducing cultural practices of manhood, quote unquote. But they also complained about people um, acting like truckers and carrying cigarettes in their socks and carrying worry beads. So like these um, forms of masculine performances that are feel like, like associated with kind of more rural, more backward, less civilized, um, and more working class uh, masculinities. So it seems that since like, I mean, and we're seeing lots of those tropes play out today, um, in the talks, this is like literally in the last two, three days, this has been in the news in Turkey a lot now, there is um, the, the already existing backlash against Syrian refugees um, in Turkey today is now turning, taking that classic turn where um, the complaints are now turning to, um, we have to get rid of Syrian refugees because, and they're like equal Syrian refugee man, this, the gender is not even, because they pose a threat to Turkish women. They are, um, you know, we see them act inappropriately and try to film women, you know, um, from like with their cameras. And so there's this like, you know, the, this stereotypical uncivilized, um, racialized um, men who are um, potentially violent and are kind of like bombs waiting to explode on the social scene. So, um, but to come to your point about the distinction between cis feminists and trans feminists, and when cis feminists say um, turf um, is a Western concept and is irrelevant to Turkey, um, it is, um, 
And and I think your question is, you know, how to answer this or what to do vis-a-vis, -vis, like if these terms are useful, etc. Um, I I will refer us, I guess, to um, Rahul Rao's great book, um, Out of Time, in which he asks the very important and helpful question of what to do in a context of post-coloniality post where both claims that homosexuality is Western and homophobia is Western live side by side, mm -hmm. right? So what to make out of that moment and how to move around and through that moment. Um, and I think, um, you know, I don't want to take the easy way out because I can't say, I'm a scholar, I'm not supposed to produce solutions to social problems, I'm just supposed to analyze them. But there's a way in which, I, but I also believe in analysis. I don't think we can act before we have the analysis in place. Uh, we can't decide what to do. Um, so in that sense, I think that the, the framing um, that he does, and I think the framing we can do with an argument like, but turf is a Western um, term, it has no relevance to the Turkish context, is to say, um, so which terms um, are debated as irrelevant and foreign, and which terms aren't? what is embraced and what is not. And that's what I tried to do. I hope my example, like I, you know, tried to make it short, it wasn't too confusing when I tried to say, you know, it is not, we can't imagine the world consisting of this homogeneous West where some liberal ideologies are produced and then they're shipped to the rest of the world and everybody like absorbs them. Um, the, the West, quote unquote, is a um, very contradictory and complex space. I also put the word in quotation marks all the time because it does not obviously designate a geographic location. But but it um, not only are liberal um, theories, you know, produce their travel, but also post-structural critiques. Everybody takes them up, everybody engages them, and people engage in that with them in really unexpected ways. And by which I don't mean, I also don't mean um, people are like liberal free agents and they can use words and terminology the way they please. I think that like, like and this is the translation studies bit that I find really helpful. I rather suggest that structurally meaning and language are always fractured already. They don't need individuals to playfully recreate meaning. Like things already always don't fully translate and people are not always properly hailed by ideology. Sometimes people are misinterpolated. They think things address them, but they don't. But do you know what I mean? So, so in that sense, I think that to the argument that turf is a Western phenomenon and it's irrelevant to Turkey, um, I would, um, I guess, pose the question, um, what are the conditions of possibility for a term like turf to arrive at Turkey and for some people to find it useful and others not to, whereas feminist, for instance, the same people wouldn't say it's a Western term and it's irrelevant. Does, does this answer your question? Sure. Okay. okay. Um, and to the, um, and to your second point, you're absolutely right. So um, this is, I think, a real limitation of the book, but and I chose to do one thing and I did that and hopefully it works, but it means that I didn't do other things. So. Um, to me, the book comes out of, and I think a lot of our work does probably, um, out of a real frustration to see particular frameworks become, um, not the frameworks themselves, but the way in which they become became paradigmatic. Um, and in the US context in which I lived and worked, that was um, the, the fr those were the frameworks of sort of like homo, -nation homo nationalism and Islamophobia as the dominant frameworks to make sense of any moment sexuality and Islam came together. And I couldn't find stuff to teach with. I couldn't even find, I taught two separate courses, one on neoliberalism and sexuality and another one on gender, sexuality and Islam. Because those two frameworks just refused to come together. So the book was also written, I mean, it was written out of a desire to account for the really rich and interesting feminist and queer activism that happens in Turkey and to push back against the particular framework that I saw to be um, dominant to the extent that it is like a paradigm that won't shift. So in that sense, I'm hoping that I have contributed a little bit of a, you know, like, you know, I, I threw something at it to make it a little bit more messy, but that means that I'm, I don't really, then I repeat the, you know, and here is, through citing those particular works, I think through my particular citational strategies, because I wanted to, 
complicate that discussion. I leave out other discussions on other sites, and um, and I think that um, that is, yeah, absolutely a shortcoming of the work. The one thing that I will say though, um, maybe like one thing that that I would like to do or think with going forward um, is since. One of the things I try to say in the book is um, it's not that we're done talking about Islamophobia because we're not, that's obvious, but it is not like as a uniform, like uniform thing uh, with no history, no complexity. Like, I mean, the, the same thing is done um, in like a couple of the works we're thinking with at the masterclass tomorrow in uh, both Christopher Chitty's Sexual Hegemony and Rahul Rao's um, Out of Time, they complicate homophobia as a timeless thing. They say, let's look at how it takes shape, where it takes shape, and under what circumstances. Is it the same thing throughout time? Like, if there's no timeless homosexual, can there be a timeless homophobia? And I think we should say, is there a timeless Islamophobia? Is there a shapeless, like, you know, is it the same everywhere we go? And then we can look at the different articulations of Islamophobia and I have I remember a conversation with a colleague who thinks that in the Turkish context Islamophobia as a um, as what is done makes no sense but there's something we need to name like is it anti-Islamism is it anti-Islam not anti-Islamism that would be wrong but there is a particular very strong staunch secularist um, frame that will not have any room for like so they were against the headscarf they still are they will homogenize everybody who wears the headscarf they so there so we need to name that something but the moment we name it islamophobia and put it together with everything else a lot of um things disappear one of the things that disappears to me is a way of thinking about potential ways out potential political shifts potential solidarities like those disappear with everything else I think so it's not just you know to go back to the question of what what can a quote unquote a scholar do I think that thinking about these things in detail really has an implication on what solutions quote unquote um, and what collaborations and what solidarities can be imagined I hope these answer your Definitely. comments thank you so I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes, we can. Yeah, maybe we can have. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you. So yes, maybe we can have 20, 20 minutes, 25 minutes uh, for Q and A. Yeah. Uh, but we need to rephrase the question because. Uh, I, okay. We the can, sound. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now we have a knife. I see. This yeah. is the fourth <laughs> try. Oh, <that's> right. <laughs> share my comment uh, yeah because I'm coming from China mm-hmm. so I, I think we have some kind of similar because we uh, yeah all belong to the eastern part so our culture you know different from the western one so just now you mentioned about you uh, that yeah people will think that's western things not 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 you know eastern so the, the culture uh, especially uh, Concerning with uh, LGBT cure theory, it's uh, uh, yeah, ordinary people, most of the majority of the people, I mean, uh, find it quite difficult to accept that. So while I am yeah, also translating, uh, I have um, translated a book from English to Chinese uh, uh, about the feminism. I also found some found some kind of uh, concepts difficult to translate into my language, Chinese, you know, Mm -hmm. because just a different kind of situation, different kind of culture. So just now you mentioned about that. So yeah, the way you translate into another uh, words, another language, then uh, people may have mm, different, you know, understanding of of that that word. And the the meaning uh, uh, may, just you know, change a bit. Yeah, <laughs> but I think that's the thank you uh, so much. Bless you. The, like I, I mean, t- if it gives you any relief, 
um, there, you know, I don't think there is perfect translation anyway, even if you had the exact right word. Yeah. And that has something to do with reception and reading and, yeah. and like, you know, meaning happens at the intersection of um, text and people. <laughs> Um, so and and I think in that sense, writing a book and then you know having a year pass, like I find it really liberating because I have absolutely no control over how people read it yes. and understand it, and they might completely misunderstand what I mean, and I can't do anything about it. So in that sense, the author is dead, I think, and that's a good thing. Um, we need to let text go, but I also do understand because I also occasionally translate, and I have to translate them. I mean, obviously, yeah. all the tr translations from Turkish to English are mine in the book. And I have written some different texts in which I had to translate different parts of interviews. And there are some words that don't exist in every language. Um, and then I usually choose not to translate them. I leave them in its original and I have big explanations. That will not work for a lot of texts. Obviously, this is rare. But I think that those, um, I think that those are sometimes good, you know, um, Good reminders that not everything translates, but sometimes I think they hide the fact that, um, or they they obscure, I would say, the reality that, um, I guess that means the same thing. Anyway, that even if we speak the same language, we're not necessarily fully understanding each other. That I think is the ideology. Like the language is actually quite opaque, but I think it has an ideology of transparency. So. Um, so for instance, like the logic of this critical translation scholars work, studies work for me when um, I'm in the classroom and I'm teaching students and we're all speaking English and I don't assume that they understand what I'm saying. I mean, I just don't, I can't. We're talking about theory, there's complicated, you know, um, c concepts I want them to understand. So that's part of me making sure, but I have so many moments. And I think this is a teaching thing lots of us do without thinking of it as any, have anything to do with translation. But I will say something, and then I will say, can someone rephrase what I just said? Or can someone ask this in a different way? Just so that we can see that, you know, meaning itself, itself is always fractured, and we, you know, have to live with that reality. Um, that doesn't mean people can't communicate or get along. But I think imagining a transparency to language as a particular kind of construct is itself a myth and an ideological effect. So, so when you're not finding words, to me it's not that different from when you find words, but who knows how people are going to read them, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. What are you translating? What's um, the text? Uh, that's a, a new, yeah, well, basically for some kind of, uh, the name is uh, uh, both both uh, teaches you, you know, uh, how to, uh, yeah, uh, uh, about the feminist uh, the questions of uh, daily life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And uh, uh, yeah, so just now you in the very beginning we, you talked about the, you know, ideological you know background of Turkey. Mm -hmm. So that I think that's also connected with yeah, yeah the. The theory and the translation and the understanding of meaning, I mean. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Domi? Uh, thank you for everything. I, I wanted to go back to something you said from the beginning, mm -hmm. which I think it was maybe the setup of, of your research, which is the neoliberalism and Islam mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in Turkey and yeah. the post 1980s and, and all that. I was just wondering what kind of, uh, what does it do, and maybe how people react, both, let's say, activists from the LGBT community, but also uh, you know, left-wing activists, this idea of seeing Islam in Turkey as a neoliberal enterprise, or seeing so many connections between Islam and, and neoliberal mechanisms. Because I can imagine that from a certain conservative perspective in Turkey, if neoliberalism is equated with a certain Western perspective, then to think that Islam has anything to do with a certain neoliberal Western kind of discourse, it's almost some kind of uh, short circuiting. Mm -hmm. If Islam is, is, is presented from conservative Turkish party as oppositional to a certain infiltrations, quote unquote, a Western idea, then to see that there is something within uh, Turkey and Islam 
to be neoliberal might, must do something very complicated. And, uh, yeah. yeah, it does. And there's a great book about that that oh. I didn't write. Someone else did. Okay. <laughs> um, it's great. It was very helpful to me. Um, so Jihan Tual, who's a sociologist at UC Berkeley, has a book called um, Passive Revolution. And um, he actually does an ethnography of the transformation of the radical Islamists uh, into neoliberal Islamists under a KP regime um, in like one neighborhood that he observes in Istanbul. Um, because so the... Um, Islamist politics pre AKP um, and and some of the founders of that party are descendants from this other party was um, anti West anti state in fact in some ways and anti big business and he traces the incorporation of a lot of these um, you know and and there were there were um, politicians who were obviously not anti state because they were trying to you know get seats at the parliament um, and even they were critiqued by um, some sort of um, more radical Islamists for thinking that the state could be a solution to anything. But that part, like the leader of that party, Arba Khan, was you know, critical of um, you know, interest to start with um, and, and overall the West. So um, the incorporation of radical Islam into a much more kind of neoliberal Islam has been um, AKP's, I think, big revolution. Um, actually, I do agree with that. Um, and it is, it is a big social change. I don't know if this answers your question, um, or if that question was just, is this, isn't this a big, but, but it is, I mean, the thing, the thing is, um, the tricky thing and the, I guess, uh, evil thing with ideology is that it is very good at hiding its own contradictions. It, it becomes almost more powerful through its contradictions than becoming a co cohesive thing. So um, nobody now says, wait, you know, if we're, I mean, it, it's not, even though Erdogan's speeches are full of sort of like he imagines, he imaginatively addresses the IMF and the World Bank all the time, he imaginatively addresses EU and or whatever, like several politicians in Europe or in, you know, um, there are these moments of like, a Merkel, you know, a MFA, like constantly. Um, and I write a little bit about that because I think that in the last chapter, one of the things that I argue um, in this critique versus comments chapter is, um, to me, the, the one thing that is missing from left politics is magic and enchantment, which the right wing has done an amazing job of. So with, I think, um, a particular kind of secular modernity overtaking left politics, um, everything that seemed enchanted was lost and, there, and nothing replaced it. Whereas on the right wing, you have nationalism, you have religion, you have, like, you have a lot of things to follow. And, and there are, there's a magical quality to some of his talks where there are imagined international lobbies threatening Turkey and the Turkish economy magically recovers from these. Like, it, it is like this mythological thing that people, I think, are enchanted by, and the left has nothing like that to offer. I say until until there was a creation of a commons during Giza Park uprisings, and that gave people a sense of enchantment and magic, and I, we need more of that, obviously. Uh, but anyway, this is making the answer longer than it needs to be. Uh, but but yeah, I think that there's, there's a combination of um, the nature of ideology that um, works through contradictions and works really well through contradictions. There's a little bit of how um, Erdogan himself has done a good job narrating a, like almost a mythologized um, national economy as the thing to protect from all the foreign powers um, that everyone's really jealous of, <laughs> which is like tanking by the second, by the way, and even then. Um, people like, I am jealous. That's it. That's another great framing. The whole world is jealous. Why wouldn't I be? Okay, yes, exactly. Yes. And, and then you, yes. Hey, thank you so much both for the talk as well as the conversation. Uh, but as I was kind of listening to this, uh, and of course, I mean, Leila would know that there are many resonances with how the Hindu right, for example, kind of adopts the language of 
actually in some ways the magic of neoliberalism, right? So I just finished reading this really interesting article about these kind of well, human rights violation, I mean, where you know the Home Minister critiques something like human rights uh, while they're doing uh, in some militarized context like certain violations that occur which become like human rights abuses, but then what happens very interestingly in the government response is a certain language of decolonization is adopted um, through this also this neoliberal ethic of uh, innovation and hope, right? And this the like, neoliberal magic of uh, liberation, hope to like, kind of construct another kind of universal humanity that is endorsed by a particular religious theology. Um, that's what this article by a colleague who works in Kashmir uh, brings out really nicely. What's, can I ask what's the name of the colleague or the actor? Sure, it's Sharbani Sharma, and uh, it's just out in the Journal of Human Rights, uh, okay. where she talks about this particular event, about this human shield that was paraded in Kashmir, and then when the... Uh, so, um, so my question is, and I was also really kind of curious about what critical translation studies would have to say about also categories that move, therefore, in ways that become reified rather than fractured. So Hinduphobia, for example, is a category that is, I think, derives from Islamophobia, but kind of reverses it in order to kind of claim a certain kind of victimhood. Uh, that is also speaking, it's kind of mirroring a kind of Western logic, which is translated through the university, but also through what they assume are the liberal intellectuals that they're speaking against. There's a very interesting mirroring that happens. So I was just kind of wondering about the neoliberalism aspect of it and how certain terms like hope, innovation, order, uh, certain kind of neoliberal masculinity that makes change happen also becomes the, I mean, I, I, that, I think what's really interesting about these parties is that they've really managed to very creatively combine these neoliberal logics with this religious theology to I mean, I was just kind of wondering because it was just so resonant with uh, things that are happening. Is like, how then does neoliberalism and translation then, uh, or is it just about power and order and the global political economy? But is there a way outside just being like, yeah, my God, this is just about power and look at the logic of capital kind of moving across the globe? Or would you say there's something interesting happening in the way these categories get? innovated with by these kind of parties, authoritarian regimes that seem to be very good at kind of mobilizing the languages that <coughs> in different categories and doing something very different with them. Okay. I think that's a great <laughs> question. I'm hoping I'm hopefully yeah, understanding yeah, it. But but let me just say some things and if I don't get it, yeah, you should tell me. Yeah, okay, now do you wanna ask it too? And then I'm, yeah. yeah. Because they're called teaching <laughs> Okay, this, you you prepared <laughs> for this. Before, before me, but, but I was also thinking around the like, phrase neo the Islam because yeah, I don't like it, but also it makes sense. So um, in, in some respect, but I was thinking what you have said earlier about this neoliberal morality. So because when you think about neoliberalism, there's always this discussion of the retreat of the state, all this kind of stuff, thing, whatever, which is not happening in, in the way we see in, in the West in Turkey. And, and I was thinking about other cases like Brazil, India, other right-wing regimes. It seems to me that there is a particular form of no neoliberal morality that capitalizes on the language of rights, language of hope, innovation. And for I, not only in the global south, I have one of the MA students who is writing a thesis on uh, like uh, pro-choice uh, like uh, women in Ireland uh, who are reunionizing re this kind of rights discourse about like uh, to like kind of to uh, like mobilize their right wing discourses, right? Uh, so this this like and I I'm, I'm also thinking about all this kind of focus on family values across because I grew up in Turkey but I moved to United States in 2006 and like since I lived in Iraq for 15 years and during this period that it's just the kind of different phase of AKP what I noticed that AKP resembled more the like, AKP discourses resembled more like the discourse that I spoke in the US. So like when I was growing up, abortion was not a problem at all in most of the conservative circles. 
But the organized start seeing the like phrases like abortion as a murder. So uh again yeah, is there is something definitely Islamic about it. But on the other hand, I feel that there is this that's kind of it is part of this emergent global phenomena of uh, like conservatism, family values, uh, whatsoever. So I am trying to understand like uh, how can we make better sense of it. Maybe should we put in thinking out in relation to translation, should we put it more in conversation with other re regions? So instead, even the framework of translation assumes that there are things like A uh, waiting to be translated to B. Maybe there is a, this pool of imaginations that are possibly moving. So maybe moving or traveling as you mentioned, traveling really makes sense uh, better than translation. So these are my friends and thoughts. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's see where to start. So I think I'm going to start with this one, one point, brief clarification points yeah. first. Um, I In the book, I usually say travel and translation together, mm -hmm. uh, both of which have been found problematic. Travel is also yeah. seen as a very colonial, you know, like to have a very colonial history. Um, it's about certain bodies, right, having access to. But I, I think of travel of meaning. Um, and I think of translation as a particular travel of meaning. And what I find really um, nice about what I call critical translation studies, because there's also an old school translation studies like there's for every field, where people did believe there was a uh, you know, source language, there was a oh, target language, and then you translated X to X in that language, and that was that. Um, now, critical translation studies completely opposes the very epistemic under underlying kind of epistemic assumptions of that, which assume certain things about what the language is, what meaning is, how it works. So then, because I take the part of critical translation studies that says meaning is always already fractured, it's like translation is not a filter, like you can't put things through anyway because that's not how meaning works. I, I don't, like I, I think of translation a little bit differently. Now to this question of, um, I mean, I, I would, I'm not inclined to say um, it's, it's just power and that's it. Um, because then we assume there is a one homogenous thing called, that we call power with a capital P. And in that sense, you know, I um, say in the book that I think translation studies hopefully offers, a, you know, a bit of a refreshing um, intervention in Foucault, which is extremely, um, I mean, I want to say almost hegemonic in queer studies. And I do like Foucault and I use it as well. But this course, as a framework, um, and as an approach to language, really leaves no room for hermeneutics and interpretation. And, and I don't mean that this course is structure and then you know, meaning making is agency. Meaning is already not so easily you know, um, put across. So, and then there, there needs to be room for something messy, for things to be misunderstood, for things not to fully translate, for people not to be hailed properly, like all, all these things. Um, and I'm interested in that messy space. In that sense, now, the governing elites are not as messy as social life because there's a party, I mean, I'm not, and here's what I mean by that. I don't think it's a coincidence that we can see now, we can draw parallels between the particular kind of masculinist fascist regimes all over the world. It's like they're all reading the same before. textbook yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> before they go to bed. <laughs> but I, I, I think that is, what I'm interested in is a bit more how these things play out in everyday life among people who are trying to organize, people who are trying to debate um, what kind of a future they want to have, right? Like to, to a kind of imagine a political future together. And, in, and there, I think there is a lot of um, messiness. Like people don't, so in, in that chapter that I sort of quickly tried to summarize, I talk about three different positions, and there, was, there were at least three different positions when headscarf activists said something about LGBT rights, none of which sound like each other to me, but then they're all categorized as homophobic, even though they're actually quite, one of which is like, I actually don't know 
what's going on with LGBT people, like can they not go into university campuses because they're gay, because with headscarves we can't go in, can they also not go in, which then right, reduces the problem to something like access at the door and normativity goes out, like, like everything, <coughs> all injustice becomes legal injustice. And I say we also need to think about normativity. But that, that to me is not, for instance, a homophobic stance, but there was a general framing. So when I, um, going back to you guys' sort of um, emphasis on this language of innovation, hope, and rights, um, I think that it's not, it's not surprising that these would, that, that governments, um, and, and I guess people in power, quote unquote, would try to use these in reified ways. The, gov the AKP government wants Islam to mean one thing and to mean what they mean by it. But that, it just doesn't work. Like that's what I'm, that's, I'm interested yeah. in the places where it just kind of doesn't fully work out. Um, and I do have like, I'm trying to think about examples from the book where like, I mean, so the, a lot of the hailing of the government into respectability completely failed during Gezi Park uprisings, and I give a lot of examples of that. And it wasn't just queer, you know, um, people or citizens or feminists. It was like everybody who um, was making fun of the call to have three children, you know, like that. So there's a way in which um, people will um, refuse the kind of future the governments are inviting them into. Um, and that doesn't mean that they don't want a future for themselves, but they that kind of that um, promise of um, rights and hope. I mean, obviously, future is a good place to look to, especially if you're trying to avoid the past. Um, and in that sense, I think decolonialization becomes a really interesting. And, and so, to me, I that, okay, that's a good example. So, for instance. Um, decolonization is used in so many ways by so many people, right? It is used in completely conservative ways to shore up very nationalistic imaginations for what um, the, the country should look like, what the future should look like. It's also used by um, people who think it will um, give them access. And the same thing for rights, even though I'm not a huge fan of rights frameworks, and I emphasize that a lot in the book, I do see that um, the ways in which certain frameworks are picked up um, are more complicated than they seem. So this, this, the rights framework was the one that people were given, and I think they could tell that during the EU accession process, that was, that was their best bet. But in one of the chapters, I talk about, um, am I talking too long? Should I? Um, I mean, we're officially now over time. Over time, so, okay, yeah. I'll finish this okay. and we'll see if there are other can, questions. Can you finish by, uh, Mention a little bit about uh, what you uh, said about politics of queer. Okay. Maybe <laughs> okay. Do you want to tell me your question quickly? Um, I'm I'm sneaking it in. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so my question. So I was. Um, so when you were talking about the this the situation of the litmus test where um, you have this encounter um, or where the sort of the, the headscarf activists um, are being asked, do you endorse LGBTQI rights and being this litmus test? This reminds me a lot of what happens with the Kurdish movement, where the Kurdish movement is being asked that same question. So are you pro-LGBTQI rights? Like, you're pro like, Oh, I thought you were going to say, are you against the PKK? Because that's what the <laughs> Kurdish people are asked in Turkey all the time, this and that's the litmus test. This is the return, exactly. So, I mean, and the return, to, the return thing is, I mean, so are you against the PKK? Are you against um, sort of violent action? What about the Armenian genocide, right? Like, these are the, the, the kind of questions that come in return. But I was just wondering, exactly, so, this, so what does this, so in this context where you have these, you know, where you have the Kurdish movement, for instance, that, get, that gets asked the same kind of question, um, and the Kurdish movement also being very adept at, at sort of addressing a Western audience by sh by showing themselves as the good Muslims who are pro, um, pro like pro feminist and endorsing sort of um, women's rights against, uh, you know, with what ha what's happening in northern Syria and all of that. Um, so I was just wondering, sort of, what are the what do you see within your work um, with LGBTQ activists in Turkey as being the kind of possibilities for um, for solidarity across these different, you know, across these different what you might want to call minority activism, um, and how do, for instance, like Kurdish and Turkish LGBTQI activists relate across that? Like, is politics of cruelty one? Is is that the kind of framework that you think? works in this sense, and how does critical translation studies, uh, critical translation studies, how does it offer sort of a way out of 
uh, or a way of thinking about these alliances um, and the kind of languages that we might want to adopt, um, assuming that you know you can't always translate meaning successfully. So I was, yeah, I was wondering if you could expand a bit on the politics of cruelty in, in, in that context of um, these different alliances and where people get asked these constantly this, this, this litmus test questions of um, how do you go around that? Because I feel once you ask that question, then kind of the, the dialect sort of ends. Um, mm. That's where people sort of shut down. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So um, the thing I was going to say before the politics of cruelty um, uh, question, and I'll make this very quick um, with the hope that maybe you'll, you'll read that someday. Um, there's a chapter in the book where I talk about the travel of the term hate crime um, to the Turkish context and the Turkish... Um, uh, some of them are actually also Kurdish, like, so um, trans women, sex worker activists, uh, groups demands for a hate crime law, um, and I talk about that as a as a conundrum because um, in the U.S. context, demands for a hate crime law are understood to be completely complicit with the prison industrial complex, uh, imagined to be put forward by you know respectable gay and lesbian subjects who are imagined to they can imagine themselves to be protected by the state and the prison system and the police. Now the trans sex workers um, I write about um, have absolutely no trust in the police or the government or the state and they, yet they still demand this law. So then I look at what that means to them and it, is it really about legal change or is it also a particular cultural term that has a resonance for them and I do show that there's they think of hate as a way of naming the affective structural under neoliberalism. So when they want to call that out, and they think most of the crimes against them are perpetrated by the police and the state anyway. They're not imagining these like, you know, hate crimers that will be caught by the police and their life will be different. But it's a way of naming something and being able to name something officially. And they talk about not just hate towards them, but they talk about, you know, hate towards the Kurds, hate towards the Armenians, hate towards all minorities, and how that needs to be um, kind of understood as not necessarily universalizing everybody's injuries and, and pain and precarities, but as something that is produced by the system. Um, so it's a way of naming. So then I think of that as a particular translation of hate crimes that I find really interesting and productive. And it's not just the mimicry of the Western, um, you know, privileged mm -hmm. um, LGBT activists' demands. So that's just a quick example. Now, to politics of cruelty and um, the question about alliances, I actually find, um, and you know, the, the book gets progressively more optimistic and romantic, so if you like, start at the end if you want uh, more of a dose of sunshine. Um, I mean, I do think that those alliances are there, and in fact, the few people who need the, um, what I present as a critical translation studies framework are the kinds of people that the cis feminists who say turf is a British term, whatever, like it has nothing to do, or whatever, I guess maybe US term, it has nothing to do with us. Those people are the people who need to hear it. A lot of the queer and trans activists that I not know and are working on the ground are already quite allied with a lot of groups. And I think those alliances really were made possible in a way during the Giza Park uprisings that nothing else could have made possible. Um, by bodies being together day after day, um, and not just being beaten up or being, you know, um, targeted with tear gas, but also having forums at parks and talking and making room for everyone listening to everybody, um, and um, and I think that really created something that I talk about. Uh, people like you know um, calling it a dream. Um, and and I, I, this is not my own interview, I'm citing a colleague's work there, um, but this one person says, you know, we knew that we were going to wake up for it, from it someday, that it wasn't going to last forever. But knowing that it's, it's possible, it's always there, um, is, is pretty miraculous. And people saw a different way of existing in the world that nobody has forgotten. So, so the, um, there is, even when I was working with Lambda Istanbul in 2008, 2009, they, I want to say half of the volunteers at Lambda Istanbul were Kurdish. So th I think that like, kind of the um, ethnic composition of activism um, and its connections to feminist groups were kind of there almost from the beginning, um, quite 
readily and openly. I think the um, and you know some of the activists had you know relatives with headscarves or more pious families. So those things are always already mixed in the. So when I talk about like LGBT activists and headscarf activists, I'm talking about particular activist formations. Not that these things are not lived together in the social fabric. Um, but with politics of cruelty, I'm referring to a moment in the debates. I mean, uh, be, before the foreclosure, um, and then there was another reopening. I think during Giza, Giza Park uprisings, when um, headscarf activists, a number of them, would say. As a Muslim, I cannot say I stand for LGBT rights, but I stand against all cruelty against LGBT people. Like this was a phrase, um, zulum is what's used in Turkish, and, and nobody seemed to hear the potential of that. And I'm not saying that would be enough, but since um, cruelty is such an expansive and I think flexible term, then I heard, for instance, um, there is a really interesting group. I write a little bit about them in the book. Um, they were interest, initially called um, anti-capitalist Muslim youth, and then they diverged. They became revolutionary Muslims, and that group, the initial group, also stayed. So uh, people in the revolutionary Muslims, for instance, were framing forced marriages as cruelty. Now, forced marriage is not something that's like easily legislatable. Like it is not, um, if you wanted to write a law about rights, I guess you could frame it as nobody shall be, you know, forced into a marriage. But, but good luck, you know, <laughs> tracking that and, you know, making sure it doesn't happen. I think those, like I found some interesting opening in that moment when people were willing to stand with others against cruelty, especially as those alliances were being formed after the assassination of Frank Dink. And I felt like it would have been, because standing up for rights is such an abstract thing. I don't even know what it means, you know? So what, what do people do when they stand up for LGBT rights? Like, I think that those are like very charming liberal concepts that everybody then feels good about doing, but I don't know what it delivers. Mm -hmm. I thought that standing up against cruelty, like actually signing up to that might deliver something. It might mean that you don't walk by by someone who is getting harassed or beaten up because they don't look gender appropriate, let's say. Mm -hmm. so, so that was what I was kind of trying to think with, whether there's a potential to think with that. Not maybe instead of a politics of rights, but in addition, like, you know, why do rights become the dominant framework through which we um, think, and even though we keep, we seem like we keep getting nowhere with it. This is such a dark note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> but things look much better today, I think, in terms of what I'm saying than back in 2008. Thank you so much for coming, staying, your patience. It took yes. forever for us to start. Yes, and thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Efren and Leila, and thanks a lot for being here and also participating in this art experiment on how academics fail at technology. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Okay>. yes. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you.